Uh, good evening, everyone. We're, of course, in Romans 5. We're gonna, going to get through some of this tonight, sort of. So let's uh, just open in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for everything. We ask that you just come down in a very special way tonight, meet each of us. Be with those who aren't with us and who would like to be here. We ask that you just bless their hearts and bless their lives and prepare them for this message as we ask you to prepare us for this message. We thank you for everything that you have done for us and we pray that we grow even more and more appreciative and in love with what with you because of your incredible uh, love towards us and your grace and we just say this in your name amen the name of this uh, sermon is called the law has an exit the law has an exit the law doesn't cease but the law has an exit and so let's look at Romans 5 uh, 19 and we're going to be reading 20 uh, for as by one man disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall, shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Uh, I want you to really think about that last sentence. Uh, God gave the law so he could show how much sin abounds. But it was to show his grace that abounds much more. And you have to really grab a hold of that truth. And Paul is building a foundation, line up of line of truth upon truth and uh, precept of doctrine upon precept. Because he knows a cracked foundation will eventually become weak in certain areas. And a weak foundation, people, becomes susceptible to the storms and the rain and eventually will collapse. Paul wants to establish a sure foundation under every one of us. Now, we know the sure foundation is Christ. But we have to understand about his work, about his redemption, about what grace is. We've got to understand those things uh, to appreciate it. Because what I see today is a lot of people are making assumptions about grace, salvation, all those things. They are mainly operating in wishful thinking because they have not been established on a true foundation of what all that means for them. And as Christians, we can take things for granted, but people, we're not meant to take things for granted. The things that God has laid down is to stir you and I up to do what's right, to live that Christian life, and to be an example, to be a witness. It's not just to sit around, oh, I'm a Christian, I'm saved, I'm okay. It is to inspire us to excellence in all that we do, to make sure it is a matter of faith, to make sure that we're doing it out of love, to make sure that God is being glorified in our life. Now, Paul's coming from different angles. This is what drives people crazy about some of Paul's writings, because no matter how you look at it, you can always bring him back. You can always look at his teachings and come back to the same point. But it's from a different angle. And so you see that Paul's approaching the angle of the law from this point, and he's approaching the angle of the justification from this point. And he's approaching it from that point because he knows he's dealing with a variety of people from Gentiles to Jews. And so he's trying to approach it from these different worldviews, these different mindsets, these different influences. And he's trying to approach it in a way that you're going to get one of those if you're listening at all. And so he's, he's really, uh, you know, he's really meticulously laying that foundation from all these different angles because if we don't get it right we're going to be wrong and so he is really uh, hammering some things in so at the end he's approaching 
For instance, at one end, he's approaching it from a theological viewpoint. And then you go on, and at the other, he's addressing religious traditions. And then you get down to the fact that he uses cultural influence with these different teachings from these different angles. Now, we all know we're, we, we are of an ungodly state until redeemed. We can fudge the lines. That's the problem. We can fudge the lines of what is godly. And as sinners, we can justify rebellious actions, regardless of what the law has said. And as enemies of God, we can live in denial of our status, because, after all, we believe there's a God. Even though we read in James 2.19 that the demons believe there's a God and tremble. We can somehow get around it in our present state. And God is trying to bring us to the reality that no matter where we turn, we're going to come face to face with our lost state. So we realize that we indeed need a redeemer. Now, in the first Adam, we're dead in sin. Please hear me. We're dead in sin. Uh, if you haven't been born again, you're dead in sin. You're answerable. You're going to be answering to an unforgiving law. It's an unforgiving law. And it, you're going to be answering because of soulish carnality, because of the flesh. Because it's a law of sin and death, and it rules over the flesh. And so if you're not born again, that's what you're looking forward to. Now in Christ, we partake of the divine. We are positionally placed above the claims, okay, that death in this world has on our soul. We have to be placed above it. I'm going to tell you something right now. You're placed above it so you can live above it. You're not placed above it so that you can say, oh, I'm not going to be touched. No, you're placed above it to, give it, to be given a perspective so you can live above it. And as Christians, we're called to live above the ways of the world. We're called to live above the soulish influences and the selfish desires and all those things because it's so easy to give into it in this world. And God is always calling us to the higher perspective so we will choose a more excellent way instead of giving in to our base way, instead of giving in to our selfishness, instead of giving in to our pride. And we, if we're honest, we know whether we're giving in to something by the fruits we produce in our own attitudes, in how we handle things. We can, uh, the problem with people is the reason we're always trying to get around things is because we don't want to take personal responsibility for it. Because then we have to do something. And guess what? I don't want to do something. I don't want to have to walk through the feelings and the fallout and the emotions and, and all these other things to really come face to face with how God looks at something. And come to a point where I actually begin to agree with him. And in that comes a hatred for that sin or a hatred for that attitude. People, until you hate something, you're going to give in to it. We, and that hatred comes because we take on the mind of Christ about it. And that's what the Bible tells us to do. So we have been made in the righteousness of God, praise God, sanctified by his spirit, all because of redemption. Now we know all of this. We know all of this. Sometimes we take it for granted. And then when take, we take it for granted, we forget to tell others. We take for granted the person sitting next to us in church knows. Maybe they don't. Uh, one of the stories that impact me the most, of course, and I've told the story, but I've never forgot it. And they were having a church service in one of these big cities and the and a guy walks in, I think he's a black, if I remember, he's a black man. He walks in, and everybody stays in their own cliques, and he sits by himself. That's the Sunday morning service. He walks out without anybody talking to him. Comes uh, to the evening service. He walks in. He sits down in the same place, and everybody still ignores him. And just before the service was over, he took a gun out and blew his head off. We assume too much. 
we take so much for granted. Why? Because we don't want to put ourselves out there. We don't want to care because that's going to cost us something. We don't want to get involved because maybe down the line it won't work out. We were taught in missionary school that you felt that you spell faith R I S K. There is a risk. There's a risk. But in the risk you take away the accusation, the blame, the indifference. And uh, that's the problem with too many Christians today. Oh, well, I assume they're saved, really? Oh, I, I'm taking for granted they've heard, really? Maybe they heard, but maybe they need to hear it from you. Maybe they need a personal testimony. Maybe they need to know it's real because it's real to you. Maybe they need that personal touch that someone really cares. Because the gospel is all about caring. And yet if we don't show that care, people are not going to believe what we say to them. It's all about redemption. It is by the active work of grace, that of Christ dying on the cross, that allows us to receive life with a passive faith of childlike belief. Passive faith of childlike belief. I receive it as so. Well, what are you going to do with it? You have to understand it's passive grace that abounds. That's what's bounding, it's passive grace. It was active on the cross, but it's passive now. It's waiting for a response from you and me. It opens up the way for active faith to walk in obedience to what is so. That's what grace is about. It's the freedom to walk out your faith. In other words, grace is waiting for some avenue to open so it can manifest itself to somebody else. It is through grace that we regress by faith, allowing Christ, allowing Christ's life to come forth. If you're not regressing in yourself, in your pride, I can tell you right now, you're the biggest hindrance in, life, in Christ's life coming forth. And you be in that witness and be in that overcomer so that in the end you can claim victory. Now, I, I know how easy it is to get around it. I used to get around it all the time. You know, well, I'm going to church. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. That's enough. Hey, you go to church for yourself, not God. You go there to get fed, to be prepared to go out. That's why you go to church. You read the Bible for yourself. It's not some great sacrifice to God. He gave it to you so you could grow mature. You see, everything God has given us is about me, myself, and I. But we think it's about God. Until we get out of that mindset that anything religious I do is about God and step over ourselves and know that God gave us everything to feed us so in the end we can make it about him and true service, we're going to miss the opportunity to really serve him. Now, under Adam, under Adam, man lives in delusion or denial about his true state. That's just natural for him. He remains under Adam's influence. Okay, he's responsible uh, to the claim of the law still. If you're in Adam, you're still responsible to the claim of the law against you. You're going to be held accountable to that claim that the law says you're guilty, you're condemned, you stand doomed. You are going to be held to that claim no matter what. You're still under judgment. But in Christ, we have the promise of the seed of the woman, a redeemer who pays the price for our sin. He paid it, giving us a way out of condemnation by bringing us under a new master, a new Lord with a new life. Are we living it? That's the key. It was Christ's obedience that made us righteous, of course. However, the forming of Christ's life in us, and that's the work of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> that's another story. It is a process that's ongoing. Now, this process can include prayer, 
the birthing of the new, the nurturing of it in an infant stage, the establishment of this life in youth. We all went through these stages, by the way. The contending of it for young adults. If you, can, if you minister to people, this is what you walk through that with them. Trying to bring them up into the Christian life. The discipling of it in the prime of one's strength. All to bring it to maturity. You see, the problem is we, we, we think people you know, accept Christ as nothing. No, you nurture that life that they have in them. You make sure it's there, and then you bring it forth. It takes an investment. And boy, I'll tell you, uh, parents will tell you, uh, I don't know this personally, but I can tell you from a spiritual aspect, that being born again is just the beginning. It's raising that person that takes the greatest amount of investment, and it's going to challenge you in every area. It's going to challenge you in every area. And Paul was jealously trying to bring Christians forth to their calling and to their maturity. Now, maturity manifests itself in wisdom from above, righteousness in our way, godliness through conduct. And it's all to reflect glory, the glory of Christ through our countenance. Now, you have to remember, there's no agreement between the first man, Adam, and the second one, Jesus. The first one is fleshly and earthbound, just like Esau. The first man depended on the crutches of his own strength. We see that all the time. To survive the spiritual barren wilderness of this present world. We are in a barren wilderness. But how many of us are starving to death or dying of thirst because we're not stepping up to the Word of God where we can find that living water, where we can partake of what will bring maturity in our life? It's easier to read books about it. That's what I, you know, a lot of Christians I hear about, reading this book. Well, yeah, I tell people to read good books uh, to challenge them. But if you're going to get down to what? Eating and partaking, it's the Word where you're going to get it. And if you don't love the Word, you're not going to get anything out of it. If it's some big duty, you're not going to get anything out of it. If it's some religious exercise you're trying to keep God off your back, forget it. It's up to you to eat and chew and get the most out of the Word of God and ask the Holy Spirit to teach you. But you have to give the Holy Spirit something to work with. That's a big one. So the first man depended on the crutches of his own strength to survive the spiritual wilderness of this world, along with his wit to overcome obstacles. But he still died in the wilderness, and he consent continues to die in the wilderness. However, the second man, Jesus, desires to live us above this world with his resurrected life and carry us to pinnacles of victory with the wind of his spirit. That's what he desires. But you know what? He's got to pull us out of the mud sometimes, out of the cesspools. He has to reach down through the world pools of vanity and pull us out because most of the time we're not looking up we're trying to survive or just get by or we're settling for this or that because we know nothing else he really wants to pull us up and bring us to himself in a very special way but we limit God you see we don't have the wings like the birds so why look up with real expectation? But you see, passive faith believes in the presence of the life of Christ and of the heavenly wind. That's the difference. It is people of faith that allows their faith to activate 
in order to put out their spiritual arms and know that the wind is going to lift them up above the situation. We limit God and we fail to experience, please hear me, what we fail to experience is true grace. Because everything God does is a matter of grace. You don't deserve it. You're not looking for it. Most of the time it's unsolicited. Because to gain, to experience grace, you have to seek mercy. You have to know your need. You have to recognize your need. And that means I have to recognize my selfishness or whatever is keeping me from looking up. I am too quick to sell for this down here. The plateaus of indifference and compromise. That's what I sell for instead of being allow God to take me up to the mountain highs like the ego to gain that perspective. How many of us live on the plateau of normalcy and drudgery and we sort of complain about but I'm used to it. Please hear me. If you're really walking the Christian life, you never sell for normal. Because you know there's another mountain to climb. You know there's deeper treasures that must be, you know, uh, sought after. You know there's always more out there because God is eternal. Never settle for less because you're going to kick yourself in the tail end. I have experience the riches of God in many different ways, not because I deserved it, but because I was childlike enough to believe he had them for me. And I can't tell you how it has spurred me on to continue to seek for greater riches, to never sell for what I have, even though it's valuable and beyond any kind of description. Now, we could go on and on about this, but, you know, he's always forever trying to uh, pick us out of the pig pans, uh, pull us out of the endless cesspools, but we do limit him. And we don't realize that God, no matter what you think right now, is still keeping you by grace. But where? Where? on the plateaus, in the valleys, or in the high mountains off the cliffs? Where is he keeping you? You really need to ask yourself, because that's where your perspective is going to be. If you're in the valleys of humility, you're often broken, or you're so overwhelmed, and you're so under it, that you are being brought to a point to look up finally. Or maybe you're on the plateaus. And maybe your spirit is becoming so lean. But how much more leaner does it have to get before you say, you know what, enough is enough. I want more of you. Or on you, are you on those mountaintops looking? You know what you're going to say? I'm not high enough. With God, it's always calling us higher. Yes, he has to go deeper to call us higher. He has to take us in deep places sometimes, so we'll say, ah, no matter what, whatever, here. But he'll get us there if he loves us. So if he's bringing you to that place in your life where you say, enough is enough, or I want more, praise him for it. Because you know what? That means you're a child. And he wants the best for you. And we're very prone to accept less for ourselves. So man can do all he can do religiously in great piousness. And we've seen plenty of people do that and still end up in hell. Because it's still a matter of God's grace. You know, God met Moses in Sinai. We all know this story. He was called him up to the mountain, right? To give him what? The law. 
You know how Moses approached God? By grace. To receive the law. It's always been that. Man's always approached God solely on the basis of grace. It's never because of the law. The law was given to show us we need grace because man can take it for granted. We need to be saved from ourselves. Now God gives grace whenever he calls. This is a very important thing. For man to approach God without the call, he would do so without grace. He would do it in his own strength. Why am I saying that? Well, remember, God called one man, Moses, up to the mountain. He told the rest not even to touch it. Not even to touch it. Now, everybody has to realize that God has an individual call for your life. And when he calls you up on the mountain, you better go. Just let me tell you that. And when you go and you approach him, it's still a matter of grace. But if he hasn't called, you don't touch the mountain. Because it's not yours to touch at that time. You're not prepared. But you have to remember that. Now the Lord wanted to carry the children of Israel. But they chose the crutches of personal strength to satisfy a holy law. That could do nothing more than show their guilt and pronounce condemnation on them. We give so much attention sometimes to that which can't save us. The truth is the law of Sinai had a beginning. It showed man that he was a transgressor. I want you to realize today grace has always been there. Law had a beginning. Law had a beginning. And guess what? Law has an exit and law has an end. And you have to keep that in mind. The law showed sin. But grace abounds much more than the law. And we have to remember that. Now in the law there was a sign of the Sabbath that identified the children of Israel to the Abrahamic covenant. Just as circumcision did. Now I want to explain something to you. I am tired of hearing about the Sabbath. Okay? Because there's people out there that says you have to keep the Sabbath to be saved. And the Sabbath to them is the seventh day. Well, if you look at it and read it, the Sabbath was just between the children of Israel and God. It wasn't between the Gentiles and God. We have the first day of the week. We call it a day of rest. But it's not the Sabbath to us. We don't get it. Jesus, God didn't ask us to circumcise ourselves. Circumcision points to the heart. But physical circumcision was what identified Abraham's descendants to a covenant. The Sabbath identified the children of Israel to their covenant of the law. Now that's important to remember. What identifies us to the covenant? The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus applied to our faith. Applied to our sins. Out of faith. That's what identifies us to the covenant. And what is a confirmation to that is godly living. Now we'll get into that a little bit more. Now, law shows that only through grace can we be saved. That's what the law shows. The law couldn't save you. The law couldn't forgive you. What it was there is to show you you needed forgiveness. You needed salvation. That's what it was about. Because you are, you're a sinner. But it's God's total work. Now, to alleviate active faith, to take away active faith from walking out grace through active obedience, to what's true. Please hear me. They say, oh, we don't need faith. We don't need active faith. Number one, to accept passive grace. 
To do that is to make grace weak and inactive. See, your faith, activated faith, activates grace. It means God now can show you grace. He can appropriate grace. He can bring you into the promises of grace. Because now you're walking in active faith. He can fulfill his promises to you out of grace. So if you're not walking by faith, you're not activating God's active grace either where he can show you his blessings, his intervention. Now, what am I talking about? Well, faith, when you do something out of faith, he counts it for righteousness or as righteousness. That really is what activates his grace, because grace reigns through righteousness. We'll get into that a little bit more. Reign, reigning something, is active. Now, people aren't really learning this. We all hear about grace, right? The law has a limit, okay, as to what it's capable of doing and an end to what it can do. It can't save you. It also has an exit where it ends, ends to something that is glorious or leads to something more glorious. And that was grace. Did you rely, realize that the law exits so you could enter grace? So you could understand grace. It ends. What's the end of the law? The Bible tells us Jesus Christ himself is the end of the law. Unto all righteousness. That's what scripture says. But people are a little bit confused, okay? To not activate grace not only makes it weak, but ineffective and unfruitful in the end. Now, grace is what produces true fruit. Active grace provides a way to eternal life, and passive grace, the expectation of hope that that eternal life will be fully realized in the end. That's what it's all about. Now, that's deep, isn't it? It's deep. Think about it. It's deep. You're just not going to get it just like that. It's going to make sense, and yet you know there's so much more to it. God, I want to see the more to it. I don't want to just assume or take for granted something. Now, there are two sides of the same coin, but different coins. Let me just say that. One side, one coin is two sides to grace, and it's, an, it's a wrong coin. And then you have another coin that has the law and grace. And Paul had to separate the two coins of people's reaction to grace. Because there's two. They're wrong. You see, if you're in, uh, in, the, in the wrong camp, the other side is, an, is the opposite side of grace being presented in the wrong light. But if you're in the right camp of grace, the other side is the law. It's been fulfilled. And you're on the right side of eternity. So what are these two camps that are occurring in grace today? Uh, first of all, you have to understand the two sides of the same coin actually renders grace ineffective. That's dangerous. So we have the one side that actually weakens the work of grace by hiding moral deviance behind it, exploiting it with lame excuses, and abusing, abusing it with indifference and compromise. Think about what I said. 
On the other side, and I see that with people, they go to church, oh, I'm saved, and they're still living like the devil. Excuse me, are you saved? Well, you know, I'm saved by grace. Are you saved? That's my question. Have you been born again? Why are you wishful thinking that grace is going to, it's all about overlooking your sin rather than addressing your sin? Providing the solution to your sin. Now, this is the other side, okay? Now, the one side of indifference and compromise makes grace null and void. Now, the other side perverts it. The other side perverts grace. How do you pervert grace? By preaching another gospel. That's how you pervert grace. So turn with me to Galatians 1. We're getting there here. Galatians 1. We're going to be looking at a couple of things in Galatians. Now we've read this many times. I'm a, some, I'm a person that was saved out of a call that had a hope different gospel, that, but they couldn't tell you the gospel. But we're going to begin in verse 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ into another gospel. Now I want you to notice he's talking about to Christians people. He's not talking to non-believers. He's not talking uh, to Jews. He's talking to Gentiles. And he says, how could you be so easily remove from the gospel, from the grace of it, so soon. Did you not believe? And then he goes on to say, what is, which is not another, but there are some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. He says, there's some among you that would trouble you by preaching another gospel. That's how you pervert the gospel of Christ. He goes on to say, but though we are an angel from heaven, preach any of the gospel unto you, then that which we have preached unto you, let him be a curse. Remember, in the, under the law you're cursed. As we have said before, so say I now again, any man preach any of the gospel unto you, then that you have received, let him be a curse. Well, the other way you prefer gospel is by adding to it. What was happening is that the Galatians were trying to bring together the law and grace. And what were they doing to grace? And Paul says, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, number one, that's in 3.1. But I want you to look at 2.21 as to what he said they're doing with the uh, with grace. I do not frustrate the grace of God. Notice he says you're frustrating the grace of God for if righteousness come by the law then Christ is, is dead in vain. His whole death, burial, and resurrection is in vain. I want you to know something right now. I'm going to make it very clear. The perversion of joining the law to grace God will not tolerate so when I hear all of these people saying, oh, we have to do this because the law says it. We have to keep the Sabbath. We have to... I said, you just frustrated the grace of God. And he's not going to tolerate it. He's not going to tolerate it. Now, the perversion, of course... What Christians think is I have to do something to show that I'm godly or whatever. I have to do this to show I'm religious or pious. But I want to make a statement today. For the Christian, the opposite of the law, remember the opposite of the law to the law is lawlessness. But for the Christian, the opposite of the law is not lawlessness, but holy living under grace. That's what it is. Holy living under grace. It's a whole different, it's a whole different 
life. Now, grace is the liberty to walk in the Spirit in the ways of righteousness that produces godliness. Now, faith and grace walks hand in hand. Faith is the way to secure the promises. Now, remember, faith and promise came before the law. Faith and promise came before the law. Now, man was not supposed to conform to a rigid code of a law, but to see the need for God's grace. That's what it was all about. He needed to realize it is by faith we secure promises that abound in grace. The promises are what are bound in grace. Now, the law had a beginning at Sinai. It has an exit through a new, more excellent way, which is grace, via a new co covenant. Now, the law was holy, but God provided a more excellent way to drive men to Christ. The law is meant to drive you to Christ, to show you're sinners and you can't save yourself. You, you've got to flee. You've got to be driven. To the cross because we have no inclination we have no desire unless the Holy Spirit does it and he shows us how lost we are or he breaks us so bad we realize there's nothing good in us or we see the holiness of God and we are silent by it and we can't say anything except oh forgive me a sinner That's the key. So I'm going to tell you something today. We've talked a lot about justification. Well, the opposite of justification is condemnation. Don't forget that. We stand justified in Christ, but condemned before the law. The law is called, and this is very interesting, the dispensation of condemnation. Now remember, we talked about dispensation. It means uh, dispensing something according to administration. That's what it means. It's an administration that carries out things. So listen to what 2 Corinthians 3 9 says. It says, For the administration or the dispensation of condemnation be glory. Much more does the administration of righteousness exceed in glory. So the law was called the dispensation of condemnation. To show you there's no hope in the law. And yet people are still running under the law. They're still looking to the law. Now, the law could change behavior to some extent, the outer behavior, but it could never change the inner man. It provided some covering for certain transgressions through sacrifices of innocent animals. But you know what law could never do? It could never take away your iniquity. It could never take away your iniquity. And because of it, man stood cursed because of the law, of course, and it was powerless to change what? Or nullify your cursed condition. Let's look at that in Galatians 3. And it tells you very clearly there. Galatians 3. And we're going to look at, beginning in verse 9. Carrie's kind enough to get me some water. I forgot to bring it over here. So let's begin with nine. Thank you. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Now here we get it. For as many are in the works of the law are under the curse of the law. 
For it's written, Curses everyone that continues not in all things which are written in this book of the law to do them. We know we can't keep the law. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith. When are we going to get that? The law is not of faith. Grace is of faith, but the law is not of faith. But the man that doeth them shall live in them. In other words, they're going to live in the law according to the laws, and they're going to fail. They're going to fail. Now look at what it says. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it's written, curses everyone that hangs on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Wow. That's a lot in that small section. You see, the law could never appropriate the promises of God. It could never do that. And one of the promises of God involves life. Everlasting, eternal life. It was only through Christ can promises be appropriated. Through Christ, not the law. It will be faith that walks towards those promises that actually will possess them in the end. By faith, I believe what God says. Now, it's possible for man to stifle the conscience before the law ever entered. He could stifle his conscience saying, well, I'm not so bad. But now the law, the purpose of the law is to prod the sinner towards the solution. The solution. It cries out against man to arouse his conscience so he can see he is lost. He's a lost sinner in need of God's solution, which is redemption, which comes through Christ. Now, all acts of sins must be comprehended, please hear me, as breaches of God's law. And any time you breach God's law, you're basically going to be judged by it. And the judgment is death because you breached the holy law of God. And that's how you have to look at your sin. I just breached. I just breached God's law. We have to develop a real response in ourselves of disgust or intolerance or hatred so we will stand up and do something about it in our lives. Because I'm going to tell you something right now. I can't do anything about your sin. I can't do anything about your relationship with God. I can't do anything for you except point you to Christ. You're the one that has to do it. Now, we can always say, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. Huh, how many times have I said that? I'll start a diet tomorrow. Tomorrow never comes. It's today. Today. Paul says, awake today, those who sleep. Salvation is for today, not tomorrow. What you put off today, you're most likely going to put off tomorrow. And the reason I know that is because I will make the same excuse tomorrow as I am doing today. I've had to be honest with myself about that. It's true. It's true. Now, man was powerless to keep the law and had no means of receiving mercy, only condemnation because of it. All men stand guilty and curse. They're debtors to it. They stand worthy, please hear me, they stand worthy, worthy of God's wrath. They stand worthy of it. Grace tells us we don't deserve anything. We're not worthy of anything but judgment. 
But our love, God, changed that whole status through, through Christ. Anybody who is not in Christ, they're worthy to taste the wrath of God. But, guess what? If we have really accepted God's solution, if we have really embraced it, then he is given the avenue to show grace through Christ. When I talk about embrace him, talk about faith. He now can show you grace through salvation, through deliverance, through redemption, whatever you want to call it, but that allows him to be active again by showing you grace. You have to understand that salvation has always been a matter of God's grace and intervention. This is why, <coughs> excuse me, I don't know why that came up. This is the most important part. That's probably why it came up. It's something you've heard many times. But I think it's worthy to end on this note. Because you know what? There was a beginning of the law. There was an exit of the law to a new covenant and the end of it by the person of Jesus Christ. He is the complete reality and fulfillment of the law so that we could receive the solution. So this is why Everything from salvation to answer prayers to anything that God gives you is a matter of his grace. That's why Acts 4.12 says, I learned this as a new Christian. I don't hear it much anymore. But I'm going to quote it to you. Neither is there salvation in any other. Period. For there's no there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must, must be saved. And that's the message of the gospel. Where the law ended, Christ began, and salvation was offered to you out of love and grace. And it's up to you to receive it and appropriate it through active faith.